But that doesn't matter. The jury found him guilty. I'm here in the windiest, noisiest, most obnoxious environment that I could possibly find to talk to you about something vaguely important. And by the noisiest blah 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 environment I could find, I, I mean my backyard. Yeah, I know. Shocking. I walked all the way to my backyard with a camera and a chair. Go me for effort. I was thinking about this whole pesky trial thing. You know, the whole Chauvin Floyd thing. I don't really want to talk about the politics or the verdict or any of that in particular. But what bothers me about the whole thing is that it seems that we can't actually get proper justice in this country. The justice system has long been dead. Almost everyone that goes through the justice system takes a plea deal because you don't have a choice. If you don't take the plea deal, you go to a jury. If you go to a jury, you're taking a big gamble. You basically have to hope that if you go to a jury, that they'll see it your way and they'll let you go. But here's the problem. Most juries put people away just in case. You are guilty by default, even though the opposite is supposed to be true, because guess what? You are in the courtroom. You were arrested. That's strike number one against you. You're sitting in a courtroom. That's strike number two against you. What's strike three? Well, all it has to be is, let's say guilty just in case, because if we lock them up, then we know it's not gonna be a problem. But if we let them go, it's potentially going to be a problem. This is actually the way that a lot of people think on juries. So, if you are simply arrested and charged with a crime, most people are gonna put you away by default. That's number one. Number two, the plea deal thing. <clears throat> Let me tell you how this works. It's actually quite sinister. The plea deal thing works by telling you, we will give you this sweetheart of a deal where you say you're guilty, you admit to being guilty, which means you cannot, if you plead guilty, you cannot reopen the case later and get it overturned. You can't undo it because you pled guilty. You plead guilty to a lesser charge, and in exchange, we'll give you this near minimum sentencing requirement sentence for these lesser charges that we've given you. Or, or if you make us have to actually do our jobs by forcing us to go to a jury trial because you think you're innocent, or even you just want the case to be proven before you get punished, we'll charge you with all the stuff that you're currently charged with, of course. But if we can find a law that's worse, that covers the same charges, we'll upcharge you. If we upcharge you, you get rearrested. You now have to make a new bail to get out. And you're facing a much harsher sentence. But even if we can't upcharge you, we will recommend the maximum sentencing rather than the minimum. And rather than serving concurrent sentences, we'll recommend consecutive sentences. Now, what does that mean? That means that if they charge you with, say, three counts of something, and you're sentenced to six months for each count. You have to serve six months consecutively, which is 18 months. Did you even know that you could share, that you could serve a sentence concurrently? That's actually a thing. You can, you can have three counts of the same thing and be found guilty and sentenced to six months each count and serve them concurrently instead of consecutively, which means if there are three counts, you serve one-third the total time that you were given. So what they'll do is, if you plead out, we'll give you this miserable thing, this little tiny thing, a pittance of a sentence that you then serve concurrently, or even you get, say, what, uh, 18 months suspended. Suspended for three years, you know, 36 months, whatever. Suspended for 36 months, which means 
You go on probation right away, which means you never see a day in prison. These are the things that happen when you're not looking. These are the things that don't get put on the television set. <clears throat> they do all of this stuff so that you'll take a plea, so that you'll plead guilty, because that means they get credit for that plea. They get credit for finding someone guilty of a crime. Look at me. Look at me. I'm a district attorney. I'm a prosecutor. And I'm doing my job. I'm tough on crime. Look at me, tee hee. It doesn't matter that I locked an innocent person up. It doesn't matter that I'm doing something that I shouldn't really be doing if I'm actually doing what my job is supposed to be. Look at me. I'm a good little state worker. I put a bunch of people in jail. <laughs> Vote for me. That's what they do. It's not about justice, it's about getting reelected. It's about prestige. It's about being seen as the person who's doing a good job keeping evil people, objectively evil people off the street. You are numbers to a prosecutor, and that's the end of that. This has been the case for decades. This kind of stuff has gone on forever. Now, another interesting thing. In the, uh, sorry, my neck is hurting today for some reason, it's real stiff. In the Chauvin trial, there were expert witnesses who testified. Here's how the, the expert witness thing works. Most of the experts, if not all of them, are tainted by the prosecution. So if, the, if a defense attorney goes, say, to a forensic something or another to have something looked at, that forensic something or another, well, forensics is not a science, it is an art. Forensics, there's a lot of subjectivity. A lot of people don't know this, but even DNA and fingerprints are not foolproof. They may be a strong indicator, but they are not foolproof. There have been errors in DNA and fingerprint evidence. There are people with matching fingerprints who aren't the same people. So forensics is more of an art than a science, and forensics is entirely up to what the guy says. As they said in training day, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. So all the forensics guys are generally working with the district attorneys, the prosecutors, because that's how they get work. Where do you think they get their work? The same guy who's doing forensics for the prosecution on one case might be doing forensics for the defense on the other case. And this is the thing. You've got these forensics guys, you've got all these expert witnesses, psychologists, take your pick. They're working for both. They do work for both. So when the district attorney comes and says, hey, look, I need to get this guy. I need this guy put away. I need you to find a way to make this guy guilty. Guess what they do? Because guess what? Forensics guy or forensic psychologist guy, whatever, they need to make money too. They need to pay for food on their table. They need to feed their families. They need to justify their salaries. And guess who's the biggest source of business for people like that? The prosecution. That's right, the prosecutor who's supposed to be objective and fair and all that jazz. Guess who he's working for? The district attorney, even if your defense attorney hired him. This is the case with a lot of this stuff all this dirty backroom stuff, but it never gets dug up because here's the problem. No one's going to actually bring this up and show it all to you because 97% of cases, if I recall correctly, the statistics, something like 97% of things that are charged that don't end in a dismissal, just an outright judge throws it out, prosecutor, you know, throws it out, just that 97% of cases that either are going to, in one way or another, they're going to find innocent or guilty rather than it being thrown out. They are pleas. They are plea deals. They are never, they never see the day in court. They never get their jury trial. So with the Derek Chauvin thing in particular, there's a lot of buzz right now about the trial being infected by mobs the jurors making the decision they made because they're afraid for their lives. And it's very believable because in all practicality, and this is actually what inspired me to sit down and make this video. <clears throat> Think about it for a second, okay? It's the same logic. If Derek Chauvin is not found guilty, 
the mob's going to go absolutely crazy. They might find out who you, you, jury person, they might find out who you are and come to your house, vandalize it, burn it down, terrorize you, harm you, harm your children, harm your relatives. A mob might show up outside your house. The news might show up outside your house. Your, your, you may lose your job. You may have your reputation completely destroyed. All because you made the wrong decision in this jury trial. So you can face that. And plus, the mobs have already made it clear that if you make the wrong decision, that they're going to riot. They're going to burn down, loot, potentially murder, lots and lots of violence and destruction around your city. People you know could be affected. They could lose their businesses. They could have their lives destroyed because you chose not guilty. Or if you choose guilty, guess what happens? The mob is placated. Now you still know they're gonna go out and do blah, blah, rah, 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 but the chances of the whole looting, burning, the destruction, the violence, way lower, way less violence because you made the right choice, not based on evidence, but based on the fact that it's your ass and your neighbor's asses on the line. You are being threatened with violence. Even if it's implied, strongly implied, it's still a threat. You have people from other states coming, Congress people from other states coming, threatening you. Indirectly, of course, but threatening to rile up the mob. And uh, if you don't do what we want, things are going to get bad for you. Make you an offer you can't refuse. What are you going to do? That's on top of all the other issues. That's on top of the whole plea bargain system. That's on top of the whole threats made under the table, behind closed doors, to keep people from ever even getting their day in court in front of a jury in the first place. So think about that really deeply. On top of that, you see, he bypassed that and went to the jury trial, right? Okay, went to the jury trial instead of pleading out. Well, he demanded his day in court. And frankly, my opinion based on the evidence presented is that the evidence didn't remotely support the charges. But that doesn't matter. The jury found him guilty, but they didn't find him guilty based on the evidence. They found him guilty based on the fact that they were going to face potentially severe punishment, maybe even injury or death, if they made the wrong decision. And people, people wonder, why didn't they do a change of venue? Why not? Why didn't they try it somewhere else? I mean, my understanding is they had already changed the venue a couple times, but why didn't they try it somewhere else? Why didn't they sequester the jury? Well, with all of the attention that this has gotten, with all of the crazy stuff around it, and all of the dangerous mobs, that have formed as a result, all of the threats of violence, all of that, with all the drama, there was no hope that the jury would make any other choice. So, the judge knows this. You know this. It's obvious. There's no other option but to pick guilty. Now, what does it do if you allow this to just sort of go through the motions rather than attempting to do something to salvage the trial? Why do you think the judge didn't try to salvage this trial? It's pretty straightforward. If you let this stuff happen, if you let all these dings, all of these cracks in the facade of this trial just, just take root, if you allow that to happen, then when he inevitably attempts to appeal, he can point to these things as exacerbating factors to issue the appeal request to go back down. No, this was not right. You need to do it somewhere else. You need to sequester the jury. The jury should be hidden from view. You should have, you should have known that oh, bad judge. You should have known that. Yeah. You know, cause the appeals court's going to know what's up to 
they're going to be like, oh, yeah, bad judge, bad judge, you knew, you knew. And uh, what will happen, this is just my prediction, is that it will go somewhere else, preferably somewhere rural with a bunch of gun-toting people and a gun-friendly sheriff so that the mobs can't threaten anyone. The jury, you know, if they were really smart, the jury would be remoted in. They would not have to be physically present, or if they were, they'd be behind one-way glass, ideally isolated from each other as well until deliberation time. There are a lot of things that could be done to secure this and get an actual verdict based on the evidence rather than the people outside who were threatening to kill you, potentially, or your family, or burn your house down, or otherwise, in some way, shape, or form, destroy your life for doing your civic duty as a citizen of the United States of America. And by letting it go, it makes that door open up a little more so that things can be made right later. And if they find him guilty later, if they find him guilty in a different venue, after the appeal, after the mob is blocked, the whole mess just dies down. If they find him guilty then, then we can actually trust the results. That it, you know what, maybe they didn't find the way we thought they should, but at least it was fair and not caused by a mob. And that's what I'm hoping for, that we can actually see some real justice play out here, at least in this one case. But I didn't want to get into that too deep and I kind of had no choice because the bottom line is, the point of this video is to showcase to you, to explain in a little bit more detail just how screwed up the justice system really is. This is completely ignoring all the whole racial factor stuff, whatever. All the, all the civil rights stuff in general. This is just how utterly messed up it is and why you'll never hear about it on TV. No one's going to talk about it because this whole, the, the whole reason that the system is able to continue pulling this plea crap to basically bully people into not getting their day in court is because nobody talks about it. So maybe you should talk about it. Do you know somebody that's been dragged through the criminal justice system? Do you know somebody who has a criminal record? Did you ever think to ask them, hey, did you, did you go to trial? Did you did a jury find you guilty or did you accept a plea because even though you were innocent you were being given two choices say that you're guilty and basically be let go except with a record or take your jury trial and there's a very good chance that you'll spend several years in prison maybe you should talk to those people that you know that have been affected by the criminal justice system and find out for yourself just how far reaching this really is Eh, it'll be interesting. I have to go. Have a wonderful day. I hope this has been interesting for you. Like, share, subscribe, blah, blah, blah. Find me on BitChute. Uh, I might be going to Rumble too. And if you feel very generous and this video has been interesting to you, jodybrujon.com. There's donation links. Buy me a coffee. Send me a PayPal. Um, send me a nasty email. I love getting those nasty emails. They're, they're a lot of fun. Take care. Have a good one. Yeah.